So moving on to the procedure of autopsy and um, um, how the autopsy is performed. And the steps are important. The steps, i.e., the steps in the which I have mentioned in this slide, not the opening of body cavities and removal of organs and stuff like that. But how you are going to remember these steps? Uh, it there isn't much rocket science in here. Just uh, consider yourself as an MLO and a body is brought to you. What's an MLO first? Medical legal officer. Um, so if a body is brought to you in a mortuary and you are supposed to perform the uh, autopsy for the purpose of determining the cause, the mode of death, etc. So how will you begin? You will obviously begin from the outside and move towards the inside. Outside means first you will inspect the clothes for the marks of wounds and uh, marks of blood stains, etc. Things like that. And after removal of clothes, you will inspect the body surfaces and then open the body cavities. And, and so the, the sequence is uh, you can easily predict that on your own. But they, they do like to ask that in Viva and OSBS and things like that. So the first thing uh, you do is that you examine the clothes. And after removal of the clothes, you inspect the body cavities carefully. You can use magnifying glass for this purpose too. And then you open the body cavities. And then this is the main uh, discussion that we are going to uh, do in the coming slides of this lecture. And after opening of the body cavities, obviously, why are you open? The, why are you bothering open the body cavities? Because you want to take specimens. And from where are you going to take specimens? From the internal contents of the cavities. What are the internal contents? The organs that are present in the cavities. Like for example, in the thoracic cavity, the organs present are heart and lungs. And after uh, taking the specimens, you put these organs back inside the body and suture the body, close it, and hand it over to the relatives of the disease. So, and this is the reason um, most of the people in our society do not like to perform the autopsy because they do not consider it good for the deceased, for the respect and other religious purposes and things like that. Uh, anyhow, if you are a guy like, uh, uh, you, if you are a guy like me, always uh, fussing about the things, what the examiner is going to ask and what is not going to ask. So I suggest that you skip this lecture and move on to the next one because the discussion coming ahead is not much high yield. But anyhow, we will go through it because it's quite an interesting one. So how do we begin the autopsy? The first thing that you will need to do, obviously you are trying to open the body cavities, so you need to make an incision. The incision we usually make is a uh, eye incision. Eye incision simply means incision in shape of an eye from the chin region and to the symphysis pubis. Obviously you will take a little bit care for the umbilicus. This is called eye lesion and that was and uh, that has uh, this eye lesion has become a little obsolete in the coming days in the modern era so now what we like to do is that we extend the upper margin of this uh, incision on the both sides let me take green color for you so we from the manubrium sternum we, we take the incision to the acromion process the acromion process of the scapula is right here somewhere near the shoulder joint and uh, from this end also we move it to in this direction so this makes a y-shaped incision this is called y-shaped incision and um, certain um, medical legal officers, certain forensic pathologists like to take things uh, a little bit differently. They like a unique approach and what they do is that they take the incision from the manubrium of the sternum and they take it to the mastoid process or the back side of your ear. This is called modified Y lesion. And um, why do we have uh, uh, changed things from um, I lesion to Y lesion is because in I lesion the structures of the neck are not much exposed. The structure in the thoracic cavity cannot be studied as efficiently as it is studied or as it can be scrutinized in the Y-shaped incision. So uh, moving on to um, the text of what we have already discussed, an incision is made from the larynx to the pubis and uh, this incision is called I incision. But uh, generally what we like to do now is that we take the upper margin and extend it on each side to form a Y and extend it to which structure? The acromion process. So the extra exposure of uh, the extra exposure brings uh, is quite useful in cases of neck injury on in children because uh, it helps us to study the structures here with much more detail. So uh, there is a y sh I shaped incision and a Y shaped incision and lastly a modified Y shape. What do we do in modified y shaped incision? We take the incision from the manubrium of the sternum and take it to the mastoid process on the back side of your ear. And then the sequence which we are going to follow is that we are going to go from head to toe. So the first thing we are going to open, since we are talking about opening of the body cavities and we are going from head to toe, you can follow other sequences also. But uh, what uh, the books have mentioned and what I would like to follow is that first we will open the cranial cavity and then the thoracic cavity and then the abdominal cavity. 
So and we have taken the central incision, the main incision, and now we are moving on to the opening of cranial cavity. How you are going to open the cranial cavity? The incision is called intermestoid incision. Intermestoid incision, not intramestoid incision. It is intermestoid incision, i.e., between the two mastoid process. Where is mastoid? Mastoid is behind the ear, and you take the incision from one in mastoid to another, and you take the shortest route possible. And the shortest route is to go from one mastoid here to the vertex of the skull, and then move back here to the another mastoid, the next mastoid. And when you take that incision, it makes the scalp loose. It makes the scalp move freely. So the, the skin of the scalp can be flapped to the front and the back. And the, the region underneath, the, the cranium, the bone of the head uh, gets fully exposed. And what you do next is that you remove the brain after cutting the bone. So moving through the text, the scalp is incised coronally. How coronally? Coronally simply means from one mastoid to the other and the flaps are re reflected forwards and backwards. The skull cap is carefully sawn. Sawn is a $5 word for cut and is removed, leaving the dura intact. And what you do next is that you remove the brain by gentle traction of the frontal lobes. I mean, the word gentle is of high yield importance because uh, if you do not take care in this process, you might damage the brain. And if you damage the brain, your uh, toxicological studies, the histopathological studies might bring different results. And if you have worked in SM, and if you have volunteered to work on Eid al-Azha, then you must know that why I am stressing so much. structure. So, and uh, after removing the uh, brain, what you do is that you cut the uh, inferior attachments of the brain i.e. the cranial nerves, the tentorium and the upper spinal cord and there can be a wide spectrum of things that you can see in the brain like for example infarct you can see ischemic stroke and even hematoma can be seen this can help you establish the cause of death so uh, now we have uh, discussed the cranial cavity and the next thing we are going to discuss is the opening of the neck region as we said that we are moving from head to toe so how do we study the neck regions is that is simply you move and you pass a knife around the floor of the mouth now what is the floor of the mouth floor of the mouth is simply the region behind your mandible the region between the two rami of the mandible so you pass a knife behind the mandible and the passing of the knife will make the tongue and pharynx mobilize it this structure will get loose so once they get loose you just simply remove them by pulling them downward and dissecting them off the cervical spine because next structures are in firm contact with the cervical spine and uh, i could not find any beautiful illustration for uh, and this point or this slide so if you are not comfortable with this point uh, i suggest you move on because they are not going to ask you about that in fact they have never asked about the procedure of uh, about the procedure of autopsy um, the only thing that they want you to know is the type of incisions. You are not expected to know the opening of body cavities and things like that. Um, unless you have a lot of bad things. The next thing is the opening of thoracic cavity. How do we open the thoracic cavity? The opening of thoracic cavity is easy. We have already made the incision. The incision moving from the manubrium to the pubic symphysis. This was our incision. And we have already gone to the head region and the neck region. And why did I bother mention and what did I bother create this band here? It is for the umbilicus. You must make space for the umbilicus in the incision. So anyhow, we have already made this incision. And now what we are going to do is we are going to simply flap this skin like this and expose the underlying structures. Now care must be taken as to not damage the intestines because in most, and not in most, but in some um, autopsies, the intestines can be damaged and we, we are going to discuss that in the coming slide however the thing you should remember um, from this slide is that i did bother mention here heart and lungs specifically with the thoracic cavity why because i, I do not uh, usually uh, do things like that i do not mention um, coming stuff in that title slide in the title of the slide sorry why did i bother mention these in the title because heart and lungs are going are the most vital organs most of the deaths not just in pakistan but internationally can be attributed to uh, cardiovascular origin and uh, in the and to the defects of the pulmonary systems so the um, a spectrum of changes can be seen in the heart and lungs that will help you establish the cause of death and we are going to see illustrations as we move on 
So how you are going to open the uh, abdominal and chest cavity is just that skin on the front of the chest and abdomen is reflected laterally and the anterior abdominal wall is opened and care must be taken as to not to damage the intestines. And why did I, uh, I not write that care must be taken as not to damage the thorax or the structure of the thorax? Why only I bothered mention the structures of the abdomen? The reason is quite a simpler one. Obviously the structures of the thorax are two. Two main structures, the heart and the lungs, but both are protected by the rib cage. Unlike the intestines, the, 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 there is no bony protection for the intestines. So we have opened the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. Now we have to remove the organs, but for removal of the organs, we need to remove the rib cage. And how we are going to do that is a simple. Look at this picture, ignore all the text, everything other than this picture. Ignore it for a moment and look at this picture. It gives you everything. You see here the bones are cut, the ribs are cut at the junction, at the costochondral junctions. So uh, the bones are cut at the costochondral junctions and the sternum is thus rendered loose and mobilized. And the top attachment of the sternum is with the clavicle, the sternoclavicular joint. You have to break that joint, you have to disarticulate this joint and uh, this will make this whole region loose and mobilize it you say simply remove it to scrutinize to simply take samples of the organs underlying which are heart and lungs so what you do is that you take you dissect off the skin and muscle and cut the costal cartilages close to the costochondral junctions and then you disarticulate the sternoclavicular joint and you remove the whole um, sternum along with the, um, the along with the cartilage of the ribs and uh, this gives you a wide space to work with to work with the underlying organs, the organs being the heart and the lungs. And after opening the uh, thoracic cavity, now it's time to play with the organs underneath. And what are the organs underneath? Obviously, there is heart and there is a lung. And these heart and lungs can give you a wide spectrum of uh, changes, a wide spectrum of uh, findings that can help you determine the cause of the death. Like for example, here's a picture of uh, uh, blood surrounding the heart. And uh, this condition is known as cardiac temporat and here is a beautiful illustration of the uh, thrombosis of the coronary arteries and you see there is a pale infarct of the uh, ventricle. And similarly in, the, in this slide, um, there you see here is a illustration of pulmonary embolism and uh, this thing here is a, a perfect picture of the pathogenesis of mycobacterium tuberculosis the gone complex uh, with its characteristic caseous necrosis now these different pictures that i just went through of the the pictures of the different conditions of lungs and the heart you do not need to remember them individually it was just to uh, help you establish a concept about them help to establish the importance of these organs in your mind that uh, these are very important organs and uh, they can help you determine the most of the cases they can help you determine the cause of the death, the mode and the manner of the death in most of the autopsy cases. The next thing that most of the books are really concerned about is the determination of pneumothorax. Now, and this is, pneumothorax is not that much a common condition, but uh, I see none of the books have skipped it. So, going through it won't do much harm. There are two methods by which you can uh, is establish the pneumothorax as the cause of the death. The first method is something called syringe without its plunger method and second is inverted water cylinder method. Now we will go here through the, uh, in the syringe without its plunger method. So let's take here for example, let's take this is the plunger and here is the syringe and it's needed. Plunger is this, this part. And what is the purpose of this plunger? It maintains a pressure gradient inside the, the cylinder of the uh, syringe. So the contents of this syringe can only pass in this direction of the needle. There's, and nothing can pass in this direction. So what we do uh, is uh, simply we take a syringe, remove its plunger. So there is no pressure on the, uh, on the contents inside the cylinder of the syringe. And if we fill the syringe, uh, with a we fill the syringe with any liquid take the example of water for instance and then what you do next is you take the needle and you insert it in the pleural space for example let's take this is a lung and covering the lung is let's say this is the visceral pleura and this is the parietal pleura and in between the parietal and visceral pleura we have the pleural space and we have inserted the needle of this syringe which does not contain its plunger 
and we inserted the needle inside the pleural cavity. So if there is water inside the pleural cavity, sorry, if there is air inside the pleural cavity, obviously the air will follow the needle and we will see bubbles forming in the column of the water. This is called syringe without its plunger method. And the second method is inverted water cylinder method. It is um, almost analogous to this method, but a little bit different. And uh, it is, um, I, I don't think I, should, I can explain you better than what uh, illustration, or better than the illustration in the Messi Bar Awan book on page 1, 2, 3. And the figure I have here is 14.12. It's a very beautiful illustration and I highly recommend that you see it for once. So let's move through the text. A 16 gauge, sorry. A 16 gauge needle attached to a syringe without its plunger is, is inserted into the subcutaneous tissue over the intercostal space. The water is filled in the syringe needle and is pierced into the pleural cavity. If the water bubbles are seen, then pneumothorax is present. And uh, that's all about the opening of the thoracic cavity. And now we shift our focus to the abdomen because that's the paradigm we previously established that we like to go from the head to the toes. So first we open the cranial cavity and then the neck and now um, we have uh, studied the opening of the thorax and it's time to focus on the abdomen. So you open the abdominal cavity, we have already uh, removed the flaps of the skin laterally so the organs underneath are already quite visible. And what you are going to do next is that you will take samples from each of the organs like kidney, the liver, the pancreas etc. And um, uh, why you need to take samples because uh, these samples you will send for histochemical studies, for toxicological studies. But here also in the abdominal cavity, we are going to focus on the cardiovascular system. Now you might be thinking the heart is in the thoracic cavity and this guy here is telling me that we are going to focus on the cardiovascular system in the abdomen just because most of the deaths can be attributed to the defects in the cardiovascular system. Now this guy must be crazy. Now there is a little bit remaining part of the uh, cardiovascular system that has entered behind the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity. And yes, you have guessed it right. This is uh, aorta. So how you are going to remove aorta? The lateral and posterior attachments of the diaphragm are cut and the aorta is dissected of the thoracic and lumbar spine. And aorta can give you, uh, can also give you quite a range of uh, findings. So you will dissect the aorta here longitudinally and see inside. And like you can see aneurysms and uh, a beautiful illustration here is that of you see this ballooning out here these are aneurysms characteristics of characteristic finding of syphilis uh, which is known as the tree bark appearance of the uh, aorta and they are not going to ask you that in the forensic but this will help you strengthen your pathology like, strengthen your concepts of pathology and the next thing that, that you are going to do is uh, that you will remove the intestines and uh, how you are going to remove the intestines is them is by cutting their mesenteries. So the intestines are removed. Sorry. The intestines are removed by cutting through the third part of the duodenum as it emerges from the retroperitoneum and then setting the small and large bowel from their mesentery. And then you take the samples. And uh, you do not need to remember the parts where you take the incision or you make you do make the cut. You just need to have a global picture in mind. They never ask this and even Standard textbooks, as I mentioned before, standard textbooks like Simpsons and Amir Selim have skipped this topic. So you can skip this as well if you like. But a little bit uh, overview won't do any harm. Just don't make a fuss about each and every point. And the last thing that we are left with now are the pelvic organs. So how you how you approach the pelvic organs is that finally the iliac vessels and ureters can be bisected at the level of pelvic brim. And then the organs will be free of the body and we can be taken out on the table for dissection. And the last thing that you will do is that the pelvic organs are examined in situ or they can be removed for the pelvic examination. And then that's all about the procedure. And in the next lecture, we are going to look inshallah at the artifacts, the negative autopsy and exhumation, etc. things like that.